service that understands who our God is. I think this is a good place that during the service that you can begin to put in the comment section what he is to you. If he's ever had to heal your body, type healer. If he's ever had to supply every one of your needs, type supplier. But if we would be real today, I'm grateful that he didn't give me what I deserve. Because I deserve death. But you stepped in, God. You look beyond my faults. And I believe that I'm not by myself because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I think that sometimes when we begin to stream services, we, uh, we catch amnesia and we forget about how good our God has been to us. So, since you're at home, why, why don't you begin to look in your closet and thank God that you got more than one pair of shoes? Why don't you begin to look in your closet and see you have more than one shirt or a pair of pants? Well, go, go right now, look in your refrigerator. It, it might not have the filet mignon you want, but baby, if it ain't empty, you should be giving God praise. Begin to look around your house and begin to think and thank God of how he made ways out of no way. If you still got a job in the midst of this recession, you should be giving him glory. Because if you will be honest, you haven't always been the best employee, but because of his grace and mercy, you're still here. If you're watching this service and you might not be in the home you like, uh, it, it, get this, sometimes people think that God has not done a certain amount for us because we're not in the same zip code that we want to be. But baby, if it ain't raining on your head, if you're not uh, out uh, dealing with this heat, you should be giving God glory and praise. Amen. I greet you with Jesus' joy another Sunday. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. This Sunday, I invite you to meet me in the book of Exodus, but before I do that, I, I'm going to pause again because uh, I got a sneaky suspicion that you have not shared or liked this service. And doggone, if you're a new member of New Community Church where God and people love, I expect that you can at least hit share to help us spread the good news. Could it be that this might be the message that changes someone's life? Because the Bible lets me know that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And I, I came this Sunday to speak life and not death. So Exodus chapter number 17, the title of the message is Winning in Warfare. Exodus 17. I'll begin reading at verse number 8. Give you time to get it. Genesis, Exodus. Exodus 17, starting at verse number 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Highlight that in your Bible, Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Moses' hands grew tired. They took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. 
Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other. So did his hands remain steady till sunset? So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, for hands were lifted to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Verse number 11 for emphasis. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. Here's a conjunction, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Again, I want to talk from the subject winning in warfare. And I believe that there's some people streaming this service that if you would be real and honest, you're tired of the fight. That you're fighting emotional fatigue. That you're fighting uh, the fatigue of racial injustice. And you need a word of how we can I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm fighting the stuff that's coming uh, on the media out from the White House. It's, it's grieving me. And I need to know that there's a solution to my struggle. Is that your prayer also? That God can meet you in our most vulnerable places. Shall we pray? Spirit of the living God, we need you today, Lord. We realize you and you alone are the source of our strength. It's preaching time, Father. And again, I pray that my personal sin does not get in the way of you saving someone. That people don't hear from Chris, but they hear it directly from Christ. Well, we need a word of healing to the sick. We need a word vision to those who are in lack. We need a word of clarity to those who are confused. There's no strength in me. So I ask you to hide me behind your cross that your name will be glorified. That the devil will be horrified. You said if you be lifted up from the earth you'll draw men unto you draw your people unto you. It is in Jesus' name I seal this prayer. But all of God's children type amen. Winning in warfare. Cyber friends and family, I am a huge fan of quotes. Every staff meeting, every leadership gathering that I have, I began, after praying, I began each meeting with a quote. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from an author that most of you would not consider a prolific writer or speaker. He is the former heavyweight champion. His name is Mike, or AKA, Iron Mike Tyson. He's being interviewed one time and he gave a quote that I will never forget as the reporter was asking him about how to succeed and strategies in the midst of prize fighting. And Mike caught pen and paper and said these words. He said, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the mouth. I'll say it again. Everyone has a plan until they are punched in the mouth. And, and as I began to reflect on that quote, I would be willing to say 
that most of us that streaming this service that 2020 since January has punched you in the mouth. How, how have you been punched? I'm glad you asked. Uh, uh, to date, there are over 3 million people that have tested positive for COVID-19. That, that's a punch in the mouth. Uh, okay, you, you didn't test positive for COVID? Well, well, maybe you are living in these yet to be United States and you, you think that you in the 60s with all of the racial tension and injustice that it's being black in America. That's a punch in the face. If you're jogging while black and you are attacked and killed, that, that's a punch in the face. If a police officer puts his knee on your neck and you have to squeal out for your mother, you can't breathe. That's a punch in the face. And I don't know about you, but I feel as though that there are areas where I'm losing in this fight called life, and I need a strategy because the Bible lets me know that I'm more than a conqueror. And is there anybody streaming this service that life has hit you with this best shot, but you can testify like Donnie McClurkin that we fall down, but we get up again. And are there any get up saints that stream in this service that you've been knocked back and forth in the midst of 2020, but through it all, you know that you can depend on God. Winning in warfare. Beloved, it is Warren Wisby that caught pen and paper that said, the Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. Let me say that again. The Christian life is not a playground, it's a battleground. And if you would do me a favor this Sunday, is there at least three people that are streaming this service that you can put in the comment section some of the battles you've been facing? Have you been facing sickness in your body? Have you been facing anxiety? Have you been facing trouble on your job, trouble with your kids in the midst of shelter in place? And you want to know how can you win? The text this morning, we find an excerpt from the book of Exodus. Exodus, when you translate it from its original Hebrew, it means to depart or exit. And I don't know about you, but is there at least three people that you decided to stream this service because you want God to bring you out of some stuff? Maybe you want God to bring you out of this heightened anxiety. Maybe you want God to bring you out of racial injustice. Maybe you want God to bring you out of maybe even some people that stream in this service with you in the house you're in today. If I'm talking to you, just keep looking at the screen. No one will know it's you. Exodus means to depart or exit. It is the book used for liberation theology. And the theme of the book of Exodus, Exodus that we need to know is that our God is a deliverer. Let me say that again. The theme of the book of Exodus that you need to know is that our God is a deliverer. He was able to deliver the children of Israel from plagues. He was able to deliver the children of Israel from mean old Pharaoh. But if you keep reading through the book of Exodus, you'll find out that he's able to deliver from death. You know, that's a thing in Exodus where we find the Passover. And we find out that when they spread it, the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, the death angel passed over. And I think that's a good place to pause and preach today because you don't have to go to the book of Exodus 
to begin to celebrate Passover. I believe that there's some people streaming that you can testify because of the blood of the lamb, he healed your body. I believe that there's some people that can testify that the blood of the lamb still has power. The old song in the church I grew up in went like this. They said the blood will never lose its power. It ain't first Sunday, but I think that's a good place for you to like and say amen because the blood still reaches to the highest mountain. It still flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. Pass over. COVID has passed over your house. Uh, unemployment has passed over your house. You, you should be able to thank God that he still is a deliverer. We find in Exodus, one of the greatest leaders in Old Testament. His name is Moses. And I, I'm so glad that God uses Moses, his, his name, the etymology literally means uh, to draw out or to pull out. And there have been times in my life uh, that I needed God to pull me out of some stuff. Uh, I, I know that some of y'all streaming are much holier than me, but but there have been times I needed God to pull me out of the club. There have been times I needed God to pull me out of depression. There have been times where I tried to medicate my own pain and I needed God to pull me out of some stuff. Moses is this chosen leader, but Moses isn't perfect. So for those of you that think that just because someone wears a collar or a robe that they are perfect, newsflash for you, uh, they are vulnerable, they make mistakes, and I'm so glad God is not looking for perfect people. Moses had a bad temper. Moses had a stuttering problem. Moses had issues, but God still used them. And that makes this preacher excited today because I got issues just like Moses, but God is still able to use available vessels when you surrender your life to him. So Moses, so we read through the book of Exodus. He's God's chosen vessel. And when we get to chapter number 17, the children of Israel, uh, they are trying to make their way to Canaan. Canaan is the promised land. The Bible lets us know that Canaan is the land of milk and honey. That's their destination. And they have seen God performed miracles, but now they are in Rephidim. I told you to highlight that earlier. And in the midst of Rephidim, they're dealing with challenges. One of the challenges they're dealing with in Rephidim is, uh, they, they, if you read through chapter 13, you'll understand that they are dealing with a lack of essential resources. The Bible lets us know that uh, they don't have water. And God tells Moses because the people are upset at Moses. And I think that that's a good place for me to pause and preach because they are turning on Moses because of a lack of resources. Some of the violence that we see within our community is because people are turning on each other because of a lack of resources. But I serve a God that can provide water in the midst of a desert. Yes, they're in Rephidim, and all Moses had to do was follow the instructions of God, and he was able to provide resources for his people. I think that's something that we should learn, that if you follow God, he can provide resources even in wilderness situations. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen today. Rephidim is also interesting because in its original Hebrew, it means rest. And th this should be a place of rest, but it's a place of uncertainty. What am I talking about? First, uh, they're dealing with the lack of water, but also in Rephidim, when we get 
to verse number eight, the Bible says that the Amalekites have attacked him. Have you ever been attacked at the wrong time? That they were just celebrating how God provided water in the midst of a wilderness and now uh, these people that uh, from all knowledge have never had a true army are now dealing with a physical attack. Has something bad ever happened to you at a place where you thought you was, should have been resting? <laughs> Have you ever got sick on vacation? Have, have you ever had a good relationship turn bad at the worst time possible? This is where the children of Israel are at. They, they are fighting the Amalekites, Amalek. This, this is a group of people. Uh, they were descendants of Esau. You do remember Esau, don't you? Esau, that was Jacob's brother. And uh, literally, they've been at war with the children of Israel back to the time of Jacob. And they're a nomadic people that like to fight, but here it is, they do not like to fight fair. Uh, racial injustice is not a fair fight. Uh, we, we, we have already been in bondage for multiple years, and you mean to tell me on top of that, I still got to deal with trouble on my job just because I'm black? So, they're dealing with this tension. They're in Rephidim, and the Amalekites have attacked them, but the Bible lets us know that on the one hand, they're winning, but on the other hand, the fatigue of fighting has the leader Moses weak. And I believe that there's some people streaming this service that you've been sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I believe that there's some people streaming this service that you're saying, if I have to sit in this shelter in place one more day, I'm going to lose my mind. And if I have to remain unemployed a little while longer, I'm going to lose my mind. If, if I can't, can't find me a good relationship in the next 60 days. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I need God to show up and I need him to show up and show out. But as we look at this text, the theme of this chapter is this, is that you and I, here's the thesis, we can win in warfare when we work together. It's interesting, they're winning when his hands are raised, but they begin to lose when he becomes fatigued. And so I want to give you several keys to victory of how you and I, we can win in warfare. And the first point is this, we can win in warfare, first of all, when we pick the right partners. Let me say that again. Church family, cyber family, we can win in warfare when we pick the right partners. Let's look at this. They were attacked by the Amalekites. In verse number nine, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. This is the first time Joshua is mentioned in scripture. Joshua, if you keep reading, you'll find out has a book named after him, the book of Joshua. Joshua was the leader that preceded Moses. And what we found out is that Joshua was effective at fighting in the battle. And I don't know about you, but you need to know that if you are seeking leadership, you have to learn how to prove yourself in the valley. And are there any Joshua's that stream in this service that you have to prove yourself in the valley seasons of life and find out that God will meet you in the night season? Joshua, if we're going to pick the right partners, the first thing you need to know, Joshua was a warrior. All of us, if we're going to win in warfare, sometimes uh, you, you need uh, some Peters on your team. I'm trying to put it as, as clean as I can. Uh, uh, what you need sometimes in, in warfare, you, you, you need some thugs. You, you need a couple people that, that know how to fight. Yes, 
There's some people that need to do the talking, but baby, you need a Joshua that's able to carry a sword, that's able to cut some folk that ain't acting right. We need some warriors. But not only do we need warriors, but Joshua's in this text, but also we see Aaron. Aaron was uh, from the priestly realm. He was an original priest. You, you need warriors, but secondly, you need some worshipers. You need some people that, that, that they might not can fight, but they know how to go to the Lord on your behalf. You need warriors. You need uh, worshipers, but also her is... He, he, He's not mentioned much in scripture, but what we do know is he knows how to play his part. He is a man that knows how to work. What do you need? Warriors, worshipers, and workers. And if we are going to be successful, you and I, we need to make sure that we have the right people in order to be what God has called us to be. I, I know you stream this service. Uh, what it is is you, you need to know. I don't know how many of you watched The Last Dance, but everybody can't be Mike. We need the right partners. But not only do you need the right partners, but secondly, we can win. We have people that are willing to play in their most effective positions. I told you earlier, Joshua was younger than Moses. So what am I getting at? He, he was able to go out and fight. He, he, he had more strength than Moses, but he knew what position to play. And the problem most of us is that we want to be Moses when God has called us to be her. And so there will be seasons in your life where God will begin to move you around. But in order to be effective, we need every hand working together. I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. We have to learn how to play in our most effective positions. Here it is. I saw this picture recently. And as we were dealing, as we were dealing with racial injustice and this particular photo really blew my mind because it was a picture of many of the members in a Black Lives Matter march on one side. On the, the other side, it was people from the Civil Rights Movement. And I, I found it powerful because can you imagine if everyone played their position, the Civil Rights Movement and the Black Lives Matter people work together. I believe that change happens when we play our position and work together. Here it is. We can win when we pick the right partners. We can win when we're willing to play in our most effective position. But, but third point, you don't want to miss this. We can win when we keep the right spiritual priorities. Let me say it again. We can win when we keep the right spiritual priorities. Here it is, church. Verse number 11 lets us know, as long as his hands were up, they were winning. Hands being lifted lets us know that Moses understands that he needs to surrender to God. I don't know if you ever watch children and when they begin to cry, the, how they get their parents to lift them up is they lift their hands in surrendering. And there are times in our life where we've been trying to figure it out all by ourselves and we need to say, yes, Lord, I can't do it by myself. Yes, Lord, meet me. We have a God that's able to give us strength. But secondly, Moses continued to have the staff with him. The staff is a representation of the presence of God. And if you in a fight, you need to make sure you have God with you. Because I discovered in my life, if God be for you, baby, he's more than the world against you. God can make moves that you can't make yourself. God, there's power in his presence. There's healing in his presence. There's deliverance in his presence. Moses kept the staff because the staff represents the power and presence of God. I like the way Paul Morton put it. He said, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, please 
Don't do it without me. And is that anyone's testimony that when you look back over your life, you can testify that whatever God is doing, you don't want him to do it without you. So we can win in warfare. We keep the right spiritual priorities. We can win in warfare when we're willing to play in our most effective position. We can win in warfare when we pick the right partners. I'm out of here with this one. We can win in warfare when we, here it is, don't miss this, are willing to adjust our plans and pivot. Wow. We can win in warfare when we're willing to adjust our plans and pivot. I, I'm in the text. Don't, don't lose me here. It says, verse 12, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it, Aaron and her held up his hands, one on one side and one the other, so that his hands remained steady. Could it be that God is at work, but he's asking us as the body of Christ to make some adjustments? Wow, wow. That means... The God, he's a God that, that never changes, but he's a God. Could it be that we have the right message, but we need to change our methods? We need some methods that, yes, because here it is, Moses is tired, y'all. And if he continues to try to do the same thing, they are going to lose, so they have to pivot and change their plans. Uh, a best illustration of this is Blockbuster. Blockbuster, several years ago, had the opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million. And you know what Blockbuster did? They laughed at them. And I don't know about you, Blockbusters used to be on every corner, but you don't find them anywhere because yes, they were effective, but now they are obsolete because they didn't change the plans and pivot. I'll get personal now. Uh, recently, I've been going to the chiropractor uh, twice a week, trying to get this shoulder right. Every Wednesday at 10 o'clock and every Monday at 10 o'clock, I am at the chiropractor trying to strengthen this shoulder. And something happened recently. I, I thought I was doing pretty good. I'm at the chiropractor because what the chiropractor wants you to do, he wants to make adjustments. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I was doing pretty good and he gave me a new set of exercises. It wasn't, he didn't change my time. I still go Monday. I still go Wednesday at 10, but have a new set of exercises because in order to be effective, I had to pivot and make some changes. Church, if we're going to see justice, we need to work together. As long as Moses' hands go up, they're winning. Quit trying to do everything yourself. It's bigger than one that the name outside the church. We need to work together because all things are possible. United we stand, divided we fall. United States, get that? United we stand, divided we fall. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, You've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Lord, there are, there are areas where we are fatigued. There are areas where we need help. So God, show us who the right partners are. Show us how to play our position. Uh, Lord, let, let us not negate the spiritual priorities and practice just you for put before us. Lord, help us to pray more. But last but not least, Lord, help us to pivot from our plans 
so that we would bring you glory. Lord, I pray for that person that that life has hit them in the mouth. If they're able to stream this service, they're still here for a reason. And you're God that lets us know victory is ours. So do what you need to do so that we will walk in unity because you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.